for attending to that technical difficulty there. Good morning to everyone west of Thunder Bay and good afternoon to everyone east. Um, thank you very much for your patience as we work through those uh, small little hiccups there. Now we're all ready to go and Dr. Bariki is prepared to deliver one of the most amazing webinars you have ever received. So welcome to the Canadian Patient Safety Institute's Human Factors webinar series. It's presented in partnership with the Canadian Human Factors in Healthcare Network. My name is Christopher Thrall. I'm the Communications Officer with CPSI, and I'll be your MC for the webinar. I'd like to introduce you to our hosts, Tricia Swartz, CPSI Patient Safety Improvement Lead, and Gina Peck, our Exemplary Tech Support and CPSI Project Coordinator. Hello, ladies. Today we are presenting International Approaches to Health Information Technology Safety. Dr. Elizabeth Baricki is a professor in the School of Health Information Science at the University of Victoria. She's the director of the Social Dimensions of Health and the director of the Health and Society Programs in the Office of Interdisciplinary Studies. Elizabeth has worked in health and health informatics roles for over 25 years. She has published over 180 articles, book chapters, and books in the field of health informatics, many of which focus on health information technology safety. Elizabeth has served as academic representative for Canada, for Digital Health Canada, formerly Canada's Health Informatics Association, from 2007 to 2013, and is vice president representing North America on the board of directors for the International Medical Informatics Association from 2010 to 2013. She founded the International Medical Informatics Association Working Group, focusing on health informatics for patient safety and was the Scientific Program Committee Co-Chair of MedInfo 2017. Dr. Bariki will talk for approximately 40 minutes, allowing us 15 minutes at the end for questions and conversation. Please write your questions and comments in the Q&A box, uh, should be on the right of your screen, or the chat box and send to all panelists. They will be compiled and provided to our speaker at the end of the call. If you do run into IT difficulties, please connect with us in the chat window or in the question and answer box, and we would be happy to assist. If you want a copy of this webinar, please note it will be taped and available on our website the week following this recording. CPSI is delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Elizabeth Boricki. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful introduction, and um, uh, I just want to thank Gina so much for uh, dealing with all the technical issues this morning. Um, so tonight, today we're going to talk a little bit about international approaches to health information technology safety. Uh, this is an area of work that uh, I've been um, uh, publishing in for about, I think it's now 15 years, um, and it's uh, an important area as um, it's um, as we see that uh, with the move towards a more digital healthcare approach and digital healthcare uh, system, we're now in a situation where we also have to consider how these technologies can, in some cases, introduce errors. Uh, so a little outline of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about incident reporting, models and methods uh, that are used on an international level uh, in this area. A little bit of background to start off with. Um, uh, what we have found uh, is that uh, health information systems can actually introduce new types of errors. And it's really quite interesting. The first publications that took place in this area were in 2004. Um, a couple of North American researchers, uh, Rock Powell as well as Andre Fisher, uh, conducted some studies, two different types of studies, where they looked at uh, whether or not technology could facilitate or introduce new types of, me of medical errors. And what they found was that uh, this was the case, and that er errors can have their origins in the health information systems that people use. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at it from a chronological perspective, in 2004 we had the first publications that came out looking at health information technology safety, and since then we have have had a lot more publications that that are out there and are are can be found in Medline. Um, by 2011, the Institute of Medicine actually came out with a report that identified that this was a particular problem. So um, it suffice to say it was enough of a concern that uh, from a knowledge translation point of view, recommendations were presented uh, not the usual time period of 17 years later, but seven years later. 
Um, and here, uh, you want a good quote from uh, the, this particular report is, uh, to achieve better health care, proactive steps must be taken to ensure that health information technology is developed and implemented with safety as a primary focus. And the port report is quite seminal because what it does is it outlines the types of things that would need to be done in order to create safer health information technology. And it acknowledges that uh, technology itself has improved safety sufficiently and, and is, uh, is, has contributed to the overall safety of healthcare, but the technology itself now needs to be considered as part of uh, the need to look at whether or not it is safe or unsafe or has components that uh, may need to uh, be addressed in order to make it safer. So what are technology-induced errors? Uh, technology-induced errors um, are errors that arise from the design and development of a technology, its implementation and customization, interactions between the operation of the technology and the new work processes that arise from a technology's use. It, they also may arise from um, uh, maintenance as well as interfacing between two or more technologies. And all of uh, all technology-induced errors are involved in providing some type of support or activity for healthcare professionals or even patients uh, who are engaged in uh, managing their health or in uh, in uh, trying to promote their health. So, what are some examples uh, of where technology-induced errors come from? Uh, one is fragmentation of patient information. So we have different information in different parts of the, let's say, the electronic record or across different types of health information systems, and it becomes very difficult for the health professional to integrate that information and use it effectively in their decision making. And uh, in some ways, it might not uh, be uh, as effectively used as a result. Uh, the layout and organization of information can also lead to technology-induced errors in terms of uh, if something is not easily visible or there are several screens that need to be clicked through in order to obtain some information, that might also lead to an error. Um, in some cases, uh, the technology's design itself may lead to screen-driven behavior and that, as a result, introduces uh, errors as well as uh, suboptimal clinical practice. Um, in addition to that, there's been a number of studies that have shown that, uh, for example, different types of uh, health information systems may lead to issues such as uh, medication dis discontinuation failures, or you might have a situation where uh, a default auto-populates a box with the wrong information on the record, or you might have uh, individuals uh, document in the wrong patient record because there isn't any um, it's distinguishing feature between different patient records. And as a result, uh, that person might inadvertently enter information into the wrong record. So a lot of this has its origins in the design and actual work processes that are associated with the technology. When one thinks about uh, technology-induced error, it's actually a, a systemic issue. Uh, if you look at it broadly, uh, imagine if you're down here on the uh, left side of our, the right, right side of the uh, PowerPoint, you have the individual who actually experiences the technology-induced error. But there's a lot of things that may happen that may lead that individual to have that error take place. So for example, if that individual is using a health information system that has certain uh, government rules or policies or procedures that are embedded in the programming and how that person moves through that technology, if those uh, policies or that legislation from a government level change and the record doesn't reflect that change immediately, uh, then you might have an error that occurs. Um, health information systems are often built on model healthcare organizations or model healthcare processes. And in that, there is a, uh, usually an organization or a process that's modeled. Now, if that process is flawed and it becomes uh, the main process within that technology, you might have an error occur. Um, in addition to that, uh, you may have errors that are introduced during the requirements gathering process, design, programming, and software testing by a vendor organization, and that might lead to an error. And in addition to that, when you are a local organization implementing a product or customizing it, uh, your local workflows and those that are in the uh, the software may differ, and as a result, you may have uh, occurrences of errors that are introduced. And you know this is really important to consider because there's a lot of insertion points for potential technology-induced errors. 
So by the time uh, the individual actually uses the system, they uh, may have an error occur, but there were a lot of things that were occurring in the background that uh, led to that error. So, you know, I, I believe it's truly a, a systems approach in terms of looking at how to manage technology-induced errors. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, and this is reflected in the research. Uh, most of the time, we, we know that from a quality and safety perspective, 90% of errors are systems-related and 10% are human. And if that's the case across many different industries, such as the automotive, aviation, and uh, other industries, it's also the case in healthcare. And what we need to do is to look at the system in order to be able to reduce the error rate at the individual level. And that's, that's really, really important rather than blaming the individual for uh, such an error. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening uh, internationally in and around technology-induced errors. I think one of the, the biggest areas that has really come forward is incident reporting. In uh, 2010, we had some of the first publications that came out uh, documenting the existence of technology-induced errors and that uh, incident reports were reviewed and uh, these types of errors were identified. Some of the first work was done by uh, Farah McGrabby in Australia, and she did some analysis of uh, the FDA uh, MOD reports uh, from the U.S. And she also did some work with uh, a similar type of incident reporting database in Australia. Uh, since then, uh, a lot of things have changed, and um, there essentially has been a, a rise in uh, the number of uh, technology-induced errors out there because what we've seen is that in healthcare settings, we have um, cases where we no longer have a small number of uh, electronic medical records used by physicians. Instead of a 10% adoption rate, we have a 90% adoption rate in many uh, countries around the world. In uh, healthcare settings, in hospital settings more specifically, um, we have a lot of uh, healthcare organizations that now have uh, high levels of technology. So they don't just have one system like a laboratory information system rather they have an almost uh, complete electronic health record. And in addition to that, what we've seen is a lot of devices are now being interfaced with records, uh, for example, uh, smart beds, uh, IV pumps. Uh, we're also seeing uh, an increased use of uh, other types of mobile and digital technology, so mobile phone apps specific around healthcare as well as wearable devices. So as we increase the use of these technologies, so do we increase opportunities for um, potential errors. And that's something that we need to be aware of uh, because we need to start applying the, the, um, the processes in and around uh, how we treat safety with traditional um, uh, healthcare issues to uh, technology. So that's really important from that perspective. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a study that I think is uh, kind of important from an uh, international perspective. It was uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Palioki, and it's a recent publication. I think this is a really important one to consider from a Canadian perspective. In Canada, we don't necessarily have full uh, technology adoption in some settings. So, for example, there's a lot of variability in hospitals in terms of the number of systems that are being used. Uh, we don't have that many fully digitized hospitals, but we're moving in that direction. This particular study took place in um, a healthcare setting. It's specifically in Finland, where they have a 23 hospital system, quite large. Um, what's important about this study is that it, uh, it took place in a fully digitized setting. So in these hospitals, uh, paper is not used. They're fully digitized hospitals, and they have been for many years. And the researcher looked at uh, incident reports over a two-year period to understand the degree of technology-induced errors that are out there. Now, what's interesting is if you look at her uh, research data, when she looked at her incident reports, and she had quite a few uh, incident reports, 10% of all reports involved uh, technology-induced errors. So basically, one in 10 incident reports uh, had some type of error associated with it. And you can see in the uh, table below that uh, there are a number of different types of errors that, are, that are, are associated with technology. So, for example, errors associated with incorrect or outdated information in the electronic record, um, patient information being documented in the wrong place, 
um, difficulties in and around information retrieval and input of information to the electronic record. So you can start to see that um, in a fully digitized setting, we have a high number of uh, safety issues involving technologies. And, and this is, is quite interesting because um, when uh, you look at the early publications that were done by Farrah McGrabby in the U.S. with the Food and Drug Administration database, what was interesting is that I believe it was less than 2% of all incidents involved technology, whereas in a fully digitized setting, we're looking at one in 10 uh, incidents have a technology that is involved or is the, the cause of the issue. And again, it, it has different origins, and, the, and she looked at classifying different problems using a, a particular database that they have out in uh, England. Um, we've also seen in the last couple of years a significant growth in the number of frameworks and models for diagnosing technology-induced errors. Um, initially, uh, we had a much more of a focus on the socio-technical aspects of technology-induced errors in healthcare settings. In the last uh, few years, we've seen a rise in the number of models and frameworks that have been published that also draw on the human factors as well as the software engineering literature. And some of these frameworks, in fact, most of them have been drawn from other disciplines and pulled into health informatics and uh, have been modified in order to adjust for the healthcare setting. And, and this is important to note because uh, general models in healthcare don't necessarily work very well. Um, if you have, healthcare has a tendency to put pressures on uh, technologies and people and organizations that are much more extensive than your traditional uh, software used in, let's say, the banking sector. Uh, in addition to that, there are a lot of risks associated with uh, using these technologies in healthcare because uh, healthcare is a, a risky industry to start with because uh, we care for patients who are ill and they have um, crises and a lot of decisions uh, need to be made uh, that require information in order to be able to deal with crises. So it's, it's very different from um, other sectors. So important to remember and that uh, a lot of these models uh, have, uh, as a result, been modified in order to be able to uh, match some of the uh, attributes of the healthcare domain. And uh, what we're finding, too, is that with the introduction of these models, we're starting to see some testing taking place in terms of um, whether or not the models are useful in terms of predicting uh, technology-induced errors or in, in the case of uh, preventing technology-induced errors. And one model, for example, uh, developed by uh, Siddig and Singh, which looks at eight dimensions uh, of social, social technical challenges, is, uh, has been used quite a bit in terms of predicting and preventing technology-induced errors, and has been quite useful um, at an international level in the U.S. as well as in some European a little bit about methods. Um, so we have uh, discussed incident reports and how uh, they are extremely valuable in terms of understanding um, the number of errors that occur uh, from a technology perspective. Um, although incident reports are not fully representative of all the errors that are out there, there's some issues with them in terms of uh, some individuals may not feel that they want to report or they don't have the time to report. Uh, receiving a shift in terms of the, what the content of those reports is uh, is providing in terms of um, a direct pointer towards uh, technology as being um, a particular uh, thing to consider from a safety perspective. Um, interestingly enough, again, I will reiterate, you know, the more technology we use, the more opportunities we have to have uh, health, uh, health information technology safety issues. So, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's quite interesting from an um, uh, environment where uh, we, we can see that a fully digitized setting has these issues and, and is attempting to, uh, to deal with it. Um, so uh, we've talked about models, ways of actually looking at how errors have occurred, um, some of the empirical research behind them, and now let's uh, talk about some of the methodologies that are being used uh, internationally to look at errors. Um, if you look at, um, at the different types of methods for diagnosing technology-induced errors, 
um, they can be just they can be separated into two categories. We have uh, those that are qualitative and those that are quantitative in nature. And I want to draw your attention to this in that uh, the qualitative uh, studies involving methods uh, oftentimes describe and document the actual error itself, which has a lot of use in that we understand the error, we can report on the error, we can try and uh, address the safety issue that is associated with that error. But we don't know the extent of the problem. Um, in, uh, alternatively, we have uh, quantitative methodologies that may be able to predict the uh, extent of the problem, but then they don't necessarily uh, focus in on uh, the uh, root causes of the issue and how one would, could go about addressing it. Um, in uh, the literature at an international level, there's a recognition, uh, certainly from a health informatics perspective, that uh, mixed method uh, approaches are the best because they're able to draw in both the qualitative as well as the quantitative, and that brings in the most amount of organizational learning from a safety perspective. If you look at uh, the different types of approaches, and I, I won't talk about all of them, I'm gonna talk about a few select ones, um, there are those that can be used before a system is implemented, as you can see on the very left side of the PowerPoint. Um, so, for example, evidence-based safety heuristics, clinical simulations, computer-based simulations, usability testing. Uh, there are approaches that can be used after a system has been implemented, such as ethnography or usability testing, and then those are ones that can be used after an error has occurred, such as uh, case studies, clinical simulations. We're going to talk a little bit about root cause analysis as well as usability testing. Um, so important from that perspective, uh, what I'm going to draw your attention to is uh, it's really important to think of safety in terms of different points in, in terms of a technology's deployment. So, you can avoid a lot of safety issues by doing that uh, testing upfront before the system's implemented. If the system is implemented, uh, you might have users uh, reporting uh, near misses, uh, and you might want to look into that to find out what exactly is happening so that you can modify the user interface or the workflows or even policies and procedures as well as training in order to prevent uh, safety issues uh, from continuing on. And uh, then there is after an error has occurred where you want to investigate more deeply what exactly happened in order to prevent uh, any future occurrences of that particular issue. Um, a little bit about evidence-based safety heuristics. Uh, there are a number of uh, heuristics that are out there. This is the one example of one that was developed by uh, Christopher Carvello where he uh, reviewed the literature on uh, technology-induced errors and identified uh, the types of errors that occur out there and was able to create a set of heuristics that could be used uh, prior to implementing a system or even during uh, the procurement process to identify potential, um, potential software that could uh, lead to an error. So, and here's a little bit more detail in terms of the different types of heuristics that uh, would be used to, uh, to review the uh, software. Uh, clinical simulations are uh, also really important in that they allow one to actually visualize how individuals um, interact with a technology, uh, what is the impact of the devices or the software in that interaction, and the nice thing about clinical simulations is that uh, it's done in circumstances where we don't have uh, real patients, and uh, healthcare professionals can be uh, engaged in the process of examining how the technology influences their work, and in some cases, influences uh, uh, safety. Um, generally, a clinical simulation is, uh, involves observing health professionals interacting with systems uh, involved in representative tasks in a typical workplace setting and uh, seeing what exactly happens when the new technology is brought in. And here's a, a couple of pictures from um, a publication by, uh, with, with, by Dr. Kushnerich and Sane Jensen, and, and here is an example of two clinical simulations where the focus was uh, the technology and its impact on health professional work. This is actually uh, photos from uh, a center in uh, Denmark where what they do is they, uh, 
the uh, evaluate technologies in clinical simulation uh, environments to see how well they match uh, health professionals' work and also look at safety issues. The top one is a simulated environment for a hospital room. The bottom one is an actual OR room that has been simulated uh, to see how well the new uh, systems work together as well as the devices and what their impacts are on health professionals. It's uh, great to, uh, to engage health professionals. Uh, they have a lot to offer in terms of identifying potential issues. And in simulations, they get to uh, have the experience of working with the new technology in that, a given context. And they can provide feedback after the simulation is, uh, is completed. And the nice thing about that is, is you can have a direct uh, first-person experience of the health professional who, uh, who is involved in the simulation. Um, we've uh, since extended some of that work. Um, more recently, there's been an extension of using clinical simulation data uh, to computer-based uh, simulations. Uh, this is a really nice way of uh, looking at how a simulation and, and the errors that are associated with using the technology in the context of that simulation could be projected out over time over a healthcare system. So uh, multiple individuals using that technology with multiple different patients. And uh, this work uh, occurred in conjunction with some of our colleagues at uh, Purdue. Uh, and uh, what they were able to do is to look at what error rates were like if uh, certain user interface design features or functions or workflows were uh, maintained and were associated with an error. What's nice about the use of computer-based simulations is that it allows you to see which, um, which aspects of the software or the way it's configured um, can lead to an, an increase in the number of errors and what you could possibly do in terms of um, if you made those modifications, what impact it would have on error rates. Really uh, a nice approach to use when uh, discussing with uh, decision makers. I know uh, some of my uh, American colleagues um, are very interested in using these types of approaches as they uh, allow them to problem solve before a system has been implemented. And uh, I just mentioned this a little bit more here. Uh, usability, uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier, it's useful to do usability testing before a system is implemented. Uh, after it's been implemented, if there are reports of concerns by health professionals or patients, and then also if an error has occurred in order to better investigate what exactly happened. And uh, what's interesting is, is we've seen the extension of uh, the definition of usability to include uh, safety, and that's uh, really important uh, in, in a healthcare setting. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, usability can be used, used before, during, and after an implementation of a system. It can be used to uh, investigate uh, errors after they've occurred, and it can also be used to identify potential safety issues before a system's been implemented. So it has a lot of use in terms of uh, looking at uh, technology and devices throughout that whole process. Um, other approaches that are useful from uh, a, a safety perspective include uh, ethnography. And what this involves is uh, after a system has been implemented, conducting uh, interviews, focus group surveys, and observations. And you can also use a combination of methods with uh, users uh, specifically around safety issues that have been introduced by new technology. So this would be something that could be done in the first few months of an implementation and then afterwards to periodically check if users have any uh, particular issues. And it goes beyond the, um, the to traditional incident reports in that um, you're in the, in the setting where the technology is being used and there's more of an opportunity to uh, look at near misses. What's interesting about ethnography is it recognizes that health professionals can identify when such these types of errors occur, when these types of safety issues occur. And what it allows one to do is to detail uh, what exactly is happening so that you can uh, go back to the information management, information technology department and identify ways of uh, reducing errors based on the data. Um, one of the criticisms of ethnography has been is that uh, it, in some cases, takes a little bit longer to do. Um, uh, my uh, American colleagues at, um, at uh, Oregon Health Sciences University have developed a new approach called rapid assessment of clinical systems interventions. 
And this approach is essentially a, a shorter form of ethnography and it allows you to actually complete the work within a month. So important from the perspective of uh, you can quickly assess what's going on and then make adjustments rather than uh, taking longer to do that and having the possible potential errors perpetuate. Of course, after a system has uh, been implemented, uh, root cause analysis is a wonderful way of looking at safety issues. Um, what's interesting is, is there's a number of different protocols. Certainly some of my colleagues from uh, Europe have identified that uh, it's an important construct and that they do it in their organizations in terms of trying to find out where the causes of errors occur, especially when a technology is uh, involved. Um, I, of course, technology brings in some new uh, issues in terms of how to analyze an event and uh, it, it requires that one has to, in essence, reconstruct what's happened as well as chronologically map that out. And what that means is that you have to start looking at all the different things that were going on at that point in time. And there's a wonderful study that was done by um, Horsky. Uh, in New York where he looked at how a particular type of uh, error occurred and he brought together a number of different uh, data sources to fully understand um, how the error occurred and to be able to problem solve about the different types of strategies that could be used to address that error. Um, important because it was useful in terms of improving safety uh, in, uh, in that context. So um, I'm going to say that, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, health IT safety. Um, I, you know, health IT, health, health, health information technologies can improve uh, safety significantly. Um, they can also introduce new types of errors. Uh, I like to think of uh, the, the current context as looking at healthcare in terms of there may be some systems that are uh, unsafe, other ones that are safe. Um, and there may be systems that have, uh, are, are safe but may have some features or functions that uh, may require an extra critical lens in terms of looking at it from a safety perspective. And our goal um, certainly is to try and move this, uh, this blue uh, button towards uh, creating safer uh, health information systems on the uh, left side of the, uh, of the PowerPoint. Um, certainly the other thing that's happened in the last couple of years is um, uh, at uh, the international level, uh, the uh, IMEA working groups, so the International Medical Informatics Association working groups for safety as well as human factors are proposing that there is a real need to take a layered approach. Um, I've introduced you to uh, incident reports, models, I've also introduced you to different types of methods that can be used to diagnose uh, errors before, during and after an error. Uh, and before, during, and after a system's been implemented. But uh, the thought internationally is among, among uh, different countries and different researchers in different countries is that you need to use multiple different methods at different points in time in order to be able to prune off uh, potential safety issues. So that, that being that by the time the system's actually released or even after it's released, that uh, the system becomes safer and safer over time. And we see this actually is the case in other industries such as uh, aviation. Um, I think this is, of course, an important one to, uh, to talk about near the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, it's, um, it's by, again, the Institute of Medicine, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. And I think what um, really comes to the fore in this report is an extension of uh, the report that was done in 2011 on health information technology safety. Um, they recognize that healthcare has become increasingly complex and IT has a huge, uh, huge influence on this complexity. It's actually increased the complexity of healthcare. And that the technology is actually affect affecting the diagnosis and decision-making processes of health professionals. And that we need to look at technology and prevent um, these types of influences so individuals can uh, make, role, make diagnoses and make decisions that um, are not influenced by, let's say, a device or a uh, user interface. So um, I'm going to actually uh, ask the question, how does your organization um, manage health information technology 
you live. Uh, I'm hoping we're we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end um, with uh, our moderators. Uh, also, I am going to uh, move uh, towards uh, asking some asking you to ask me some questions, and maybe we can uh, discuss this a little further. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Bariki. That was amazing. I really enjoyed uh, the entire presentation, and we did actually collect some questions while we were going along here. So I'm going to keep this slide up for the participants in the webinar to consider how does your organization manage health information technology risks while you answer a couple of questions from the floor, if that's all right. That sounds wonderful. Perfect. So my first question was, uh, Jignesh Padia asked, is there a framework that guides technology selection? Uh, you touched on simulation, testing, usability. Is there a recommendation or best practice you would recommend for conducting usability testing before purchase or implementation of healthcare technology? Um, there is actually, there's quite a few frameworks that, um, that are out there in terms of being able to um, to drive uh, selection and, and thinking in around safety when one's considering a technology in the procurement process. Um, I, I wish I could guide you to the literature right now. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm just going to uh, make a note of that, and uh, I will, um, I will, I can provide uh, that reference and there's a few of them that I would recommend. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Uh, Gina Peck will be sending out a follow-up email from uh, four people, so perhaps she can include that information along with it. Awesome. Um, there's also uh, some really good work that has been published by um, the uh, International Medical Informatics Association Working Group on uh, Human Factors Around Safety, where uh, they look at um, uh, different types of international approaches around usability testing from, uh, you know, the uh, small-scale study uh, with individuals to so actually um, uh, morphing that out and mapping it out to full-scale uh, country-wide surveys. And looking at errors, so uh, there's some really some really in, interesting and pioneering work uh, in and around that. Uh, and again, I, I can uh, I can point you to those uh, to those studies if, if that's an interest. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Um, the second question that came from the floor or from the chat room, I suppose, uh, was you spoke about retrospective analysis, but what are your thoughts on prospective analysis? Jignesh was curious if there are any comments on applications of FMEA or failure modes effects analysis. Um, he used, uh, used this in limited fashion for implementation of smart pumps, but it would be good to know if this is standard practice across the board. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I deal more with the software piece, and it's it's not used as much in the software area. Uh, what has been discussed more so is the use of usability testing and uh, clinical simulations as a way of examining how the software and devices interact together uh, to see what kinds of potential safety issues uh, come up. And that can it's not technically prospective. Uh, what you're doing that doing is you're doing that pre-implementation to identify the issues uh, and improve your uh, uh, plans for configuring the system and also uh, in a, and also training. So what you'd be doing is identifying what you can change, what you can't change, and then sensitizing people to potential safety issues uh, if you can't change something. So that's uh, that's something that's uh, done. Absolutely correct. Perfect. Um, a third question, uh, do you have any comments on the Hawthorne effect? Uh, we can imagine that there might be some influence on the results. Um, of interest, so uh, are, you, are you thinking of it in terms of uh, usability testing as well as clinical simulations? I think, um, you know, if you, if you look at the, the literature, um, what we do find is that individuals, once they get settled into uh, an environment, so a clinical simulation environment or even a usability testing environment, um, if, the, if the environment and the scenario the person is responding to as well as the software and devices is realistic, um, you get what they call ecological validity. So the individual actually feels immersed and they'll respond in a way that um, is representative of what they would do in the real world. Um, having uh, done clinical simulation studies, I can tell you that uh, initially, you know, people have to get comfortable. Um, and then afterwards, once they're actually in the scenario and it's realistic, uh, they actually perform the way they would have normally done. 
Uh, the beautiful part about this is if you audio and video record people engaging with technology and you identify potential issue, um, uh, it's nice because what you can do is if, if uh, you can actually play back the tape or the audio and video recording and uh, you can actually engage in a discussion in and around what um, what is what could and could could be done. So the health professional actually gives you um, you know a, a insights into what they were thinking and how uh, they reacted in response to the technologies in that particular context. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, before I, I read the last question that's been submitted here, I would just like to remind all of our participants that they are welcome to comment in the chat room uh, about how your organization manages health information technology risk. Uh, we've already had one response, and I'm going to be bringing that up to Elizabeth in a few, in just after this last question, but I welcome any other uh, comments or feedback that uh, Dr. Baricki would love to hear from you as well. So please, think about how your organization manages health and information technology risks, and by all means, engage Dr. Baricki on this, because she's a fascinating resource for this. Uh, Dr. Vericki, just the last question that came in through the chat room was, uh, in your experience, based on methods for diagnosing technology-induced errors, do you find leaders now recognize the systems approach to technological errors, or are they still focused on the person approach? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, I think initially, uh, back in the early days, uh, we're talking about 2004, 2005, uh, what we saw was more so, you know, it was the individual's issue. Um, in the last couple of years, with the number of publications that have been coming out where we've gone to the point where we've isolated specific user interface design, features and functions, uh, different technology configurations where errors occur, uh, there's a recognition that it's more of a systems-based issue. In fact, um, I, I will tell you, even if you look at some of the uh, studies in and around incident reports um, of note uh, is that uh, vendors are actually uh, describing incidents and identifying solutions uh, and uh, regional health authorities uh, and uh, even um, even uh, physicians who use uh, technology in their offices are reporting. So um, there is a recognition that this is a little bit bigger than just what the individual does and uh, it is it's changing and, and people are trying to find solutions. So that's, uh, Super important. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we did have one participant jump in to uh, ex uh, express how the organi their organization manages health information technology risks, and apparently it's part of their enterprise risk management framework. It's still developing, of course, it needs to mature further, but uh, that there is consideration for these risks. So. Um, if you have any other comments about to this, Dr. Baricki, I welcome you to do so, and then we will wrap up. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that framework. So uh, I'm always uh, looking to hear about uh, new uh, advances in the area and uh, how that's, uh, how whether or not frameworks work and what the strengths and weaknesses are. So I would love to, uh, anybody has uh, any uh, frameworks or approaches that their organization is involved in, I would love to hear about them. Perfect. Well, I think we're definitely going to put you in touch with uh, that, that uh, respondent because I think you have a lot to chat about. So. <laughs> I want to thank you very much. So respectfully, Dr. Baricki, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. And thanks, of course, to all of you participants for taking the time to attend. We know how busy your day is, and we appreciate you choosing to spend time with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Uh, please visit our website for a taped version of the presentation today and sign up for our next Human Factors webinar in May. However, if you can't wait that long, you can keep up to date with our next two knowledge translation and implementation science webinars. The first is next week on March 28th with Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw on knowledge creation and synthesis. The second is on April 4th and features both Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw and Dr. Justin Poisseau discussing who needs to do what differently to promote implementation. If you wish to sign up for these upcoming webinars, or if you want to continue the conversation started in this discussion, please feel free to send us an email. We will forward your comments and any questions you may have on to Dr. Baricki. You should all receive Gina Peck's follow-up thank you email in your inbox shortly, and you can respond to that. Thank you again, Dr. Baricki. Thank you all for participating, and have a wonderful day. We hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.